Hello everybody. Welcome back to uh, season two of the uh, Travels with Bob. We've had a uh, hiatus in our ongoing study. Uh, we have uh, reached the point of uh, episode eight in season two. Uh, I uh, was in a uh, time in the hospital and other extenuating circumstances. And so we're only now just uh, now being able to get uh, pick up where we left off and uh, resume our studies of the highlights or the great events of the Old Testament with episode nine. Uh, however, in as much as it's been quite some time since we uh, saw the last of these episodes that have been uh, uh, pod broadcasted uh, uh, with episode uh, eight, I thought it might be, inappropriate, be appropriate for me to just run quickly through a vast review of what we have done in the other eight episodes. In the first episode, uh, in episode one, we looked at the premise upon which these studies in the Old Testament are based, which is uh, the Bible, which we view as the Word of God and inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that it is inerrant and uh, is complete and trustworthy. In, second, uh, in the second episode, we talked about the beginning, the beginning of everything, including uh, all of the universe, which was not, but when God began, he created it from nothing. And so the eternity of God and his self-existence was part of the second episode, and the concept of creating, the Hebrew word bara, meaning bringing something from nothing. The first two verses of Genesis 1, 1 and 2, are about that part of the a very brief statement of the creation. Beginning in verse 3, then, there is an elaboration on where God took the things that he had made, uh, or that he had created, and began to make them into the things that are now in the universe. And so the uh, third episode was uh, about the days of creation. The first day of creation begins in Genesis 1 and in verse 3. Uh, we noted that we usually take the word day to mean a 24-hour hour period of time. As we, <coughs> excuse me, as we usually use it in our general, uh, generally in our par uh, parlance, and uh, we saw that in these in these uh, uh, beginning of the days that uh, there are uh, the setting forth of uh, light, of water, of land mass, atmosphere, physical light, and animal life. In the fourth episode, we talked about the creation of human life. <clears throat> beginning with Adam and then uh, later uh, as uh, Adam was found to be that it was not good for man to be alone and then God created Eve for him. Um, God said in the creating of human life, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Uh, in the uh, creating of humans, God said let us make man. In everything else that God created, he said let, let it be, let there be. And uh, so there is a difference between the two actions of the energy of God in, in the creation. Uh, there is a higher life entity in the making of man than in the uh, letting there come forth the life of the rest of the planet Earth. In the fifth episode, we talked about the Garden of Eden, where history of humanity begins to unfold. Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden, and God has given Adam uh, the commission that is uh, threefold, work the garden, take care of the garden, and do not eat of the fruit of the life uh, of the uh, tree of, tree of uh, uh, knowledge of good and evil. But you can't eat of the tree of life. This is also the episode of the serpent and his beguiling Eve and the beginning of sin. In episode uh, six, then, we talked about sin and its consequences, the origin of sin and how sin develops even today, and uh, then the seriousness of Adam and Eve's sin as it has impacted every moment of humanity uh, since they were banished from the Garden of Eden. And uh, we saw how that God reacts uh, to sin and how he responds to it. In um, episode 8, then, the last one that has been uh, posted for you to see is the, uh, we talked about Proto-Evangelium. Uh, specifically, we talked about Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, uh, where uh, God made it very, very clear 
that Satan was not going to win and to take humanity and all of the creation that God had made away from God, but that uh, in that first statement of what would eventually happen, that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the seed of the serpent, while the seed of the serpent would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. So that brings us then now to episode 9. And to begin with episode 9, I want to go uh, to Genesis chapter 3 and begin reading uh, in verse 14. Now this is what we usually refer to as the punishment phase uh, of the debacle of sin in the Garden of Eden, which is the original breaching of the original uh, covenant that God made with humanity. So I want to read the beginning in Genesis 3 verse four, uh, 14, and then we shall look pretty closely at things in verse 20 through the end of that chapter in this episode and in episode 10. So the Bible says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be to be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, God said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the, of the, the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Turn your, till you return to the ground out of which uh, you were taken. For that, are, that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now then, that's uh, where we ended in episode 8 uh, some weeks ago. We want to go on now and uh, talk about some things that happened immediately after that and then about the uh, march through history that began at this moment and continued uh, with a very important episode in uh, Genesis chapter 4 and then on through the rest of the Old Old Testament. So uh, we have we have just read the punishment phase of what God said to the serpent, which uh, as we have identified for us in Revelation as uh, Satan himself, what God said to the woman about bearing pain in childbirth and uh, so forth, and then what he said to Adam about having to uh, earn his uh, livelihood from the toil that he would have in ta taking care of the fields of the earth. No longer would it be uh, the open access to all that they need as God had provided for them uh, in the Garden of Eden. And so as we move forward then, let's read in Genesis chapter 3, uh, verses 20 through 24 uh, as the foundation for uh, episode 9. So we continue. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now let it, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the, gar the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And so we have uh, the punishment phase of what happened in the garden of Eden in the beginning of sin and the breaking of covenant with God. And immediately what happened uh, as uh, 
they sort of took care of loose ends. That's what I would call that. I call that my notes. That uh, taking care of loose ends, beginning in verse twenty of chapter three, uh, specifically the naming of Eve, Eve, the mother of all living. Her name means. The significance of this may may not be seen at first, but uh, it appears that Adam did this on his own, but we know that God was nigh. Now, there was a breach between God and Adam that had not been there until now because sin separates from God. But Adam's naming of his wife is significant for a number of reasons, and I just want to mention those as we pass by. It's significant because Adam named her Eve, which is the mother of all living, all living humans, uh, uh, because uh, for a specific reason. Uh, Eve would be become the mother of all living humans, the original mother. Especially does this apply to all humans that would live after her in all the world for all time to come. What a place in history this place is uh, uh, Eve into. And so uh, with reference, when reference is made to our, our first mother, no one asks, who is she? Everybody knows that the first mother was, was Eve. Her husband named her so that for all time and uh, into eternity, she would be honored as the first woman and the first wife the first woman wife to become a mother, to bear children, and so our original bloodline human mother. Every time throughout all the time when the word, word mother is used, whether in reference to humans or to beasts, the word mother would bring to mind our mother, our first mother, Eve, the wife of Adam. She is remembered as the first one, the first woman, first wife, first mother, to be so honored in all of the time in all of the world. In actuality, Adam and Eve are the first parents ever in, in the world. And all these items just simply is stating the obvious. Uh, we sometimes find that necessary, don't we? We all know this, but we may not have thought uh, in some detail about it. But when Adam named Eve, he gave her a name that signifies for all time to come that here is the beginning of the concept of mother, of motherhood, of all of the nuances of that uh, word and phrase all begin with the naming of Eve uh, in the Garden of Eden. And then the Lord God provided garments for Adam and Eve, as we've just read, in chapter 3 and verse 21, we need to note here that this is the first instance in history where animals were killed uh, in order and shed, of, shed their blood in, for the benefit of, of human beings. It was not for redemption purposes as such, not for forgiveness or atonement uh, reasons, but it was the first time that animals uh, died in that sense sacrificed for the welfare of humans, and so that would be, that would form a prototype of things that were later to come. Many other animals would die, especially in the days of the law of Moses, as they were offered daily, morning and evening, and on an individual basis, and uh, numbers of times throughout the year for the entire nation of Israel. Uh, but none of them would accomplish the redemption of humanity from sin and the restoration of the access to the tree of life that was lost by sin when Adam and Eve were exited the Garden of Eden. None of them would be accomplishing a, a redemptive thing until the end result of the shedding of blood for sin. That would be that since only a human death can pay for a human sin, that God would act and send his Son as an incarnation, that is, God in flesh, to be one of us, to face life and Satan in all of these annoyances as we face those things, and then without sin, take the blood from a sinless life 
and the body was lived in it, and offer that life, sinless life blood as a payment where Jesus would assume the responsibility of every sin of every human who has lived since the days of Adam and Eve. And so as John describes him in the earlier chapters of the Gospel of John, the Lamb, or John the Baptist, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And only after millennia of time would that happen as an act of God to redeem humanity from the consequence of sin uh, in the Garden of Eden. The life and death of Jesus, of course, was redemptive, and it did restore humanity to God, all of those who will come to him in Jesus Christ. Then still, we need to notice that a precedent is set by the act of God, providing animal skins to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve, uh, in a sense to cover their shame. Sin is shame. Humans are, uh, a, a life is a, a higher life than uh, the other order of life that God created. Humans are made, as we have seen and as we've studied in another episode, uh, it, humans are made in the image of God. And uh, the, in fact, animals are part of creation. They're creating it actually for the well-being of humanity. Uh, this will develop into a detailed system of sacrifice uh, later on as time goes forward. It is, it is a significant moment, however, uh, that until uh, Adam and Eve had eaten of the forbidden fruit, Adam and Eve were naked and apparently did not know the significance of that fact of nudeness. The text declares that they were naked and had no sense, uh, sense of shame or immodesty. After they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, the forbidden fruit of the forbidden tree, they realized their nakedness, and if you remember the text that we've studied already, they tried to hide themselves from God. So, we do not want to miss the fact that uh, in an actual way, the uh, initial act of sin, the transgression of God's will at the first moment, resulted in animals being sacrificed. In a sense, they died to furnish clothes for the first two humans. Thus, it is worth noting that death actually did begin to enter into the experience of sinful humans uh, and the consequence of their sinful acts when God took the hides and skins of, of animals and clothed uh, the first man and the first woman. And uh, uh, the blood of animals was shed to repair the immediate situation then, and the blood of animals would be used for many centuries to illustrate to humanity through the experience of the seed of Abraham, the Israelites, the uh, devastating, death-dealing power of sin as it separates from God. And then, as I've just mentioned, that would all be rectified in the life and death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then we want to look for a moment that uh, God set the breach of covenant, the breaking of the first covenant, as we sometimes say, in concrete, that is, permanently, until he would, uh, in his holy righteousness, uh, seek to do differently. So, uh, in, in, in a manner of speaking, it is graven in stone that uh, there is no entry into, again, the Garden of uh, Eden and access to the Tree of Life until God has so uh, willed it to be. <coughs> and so he banished, as we have seen, Adam and Eve, and thus all humans who would follow them, their children, and all the human race, uh, from the entering into the Garden of Eden until uh, the end of time. This was the immediate culmination of this tragic act of seeking to be like God, as some theologians say, to be God. But certainly Adam and Eve sought to be like God. Uh, this was the immediate uh, cul culmination of that tragic act. 
the Garden of Eden was provided for, created for human beings. It was intended by God to be their home with access, unlimited access to him, fellowship with God that the Apostle John speaks of in the first few verses of the, his first letter, 1 John chapter 1. The results are great. Results of forfeiture to inherit uh, uh, the act of disobeying God are so great. They will now be cast out into the outer world, Adam and Eve will, where their family will be born, and where the human race will live in, in contest and conflict with Satan until Jesus comes again. God it for, it intended the Garden of Eden to be their home. But now they, will be, they are being cast out into the outer world, which is, as we have now known and studied, is the domain now of Satan. The worldly world is his, is his dominion. And that dominion of Satan, uh, we must not forget, is all around us today. That old devil is very much in the world and in his element and is active. The safety, the beauty of sinlessness and bliss and all that Eden was is going now to be closed to Adam and Eve and all posterity of the human race. And so it is that until eternity and God restores it to access to those who are his, we live in a world that is dominated as Satan's domain. The safety and the beauty and the bliss are not there as a free gift. Adam and Eve will now lose that close relationship afforded to them by the tree of life. And so every human after them, their family and all the rest of us so also will be denied that until God wills. And they will uh, have the share the loss uh, uh, to a fallen world, and uh, as they leave the Garden of Eden, it is uh, generally spoken of as they enter into a world that is now fallen from God in the pristine sinlessness that it was before sin entered into the world. And it will be that way until God acts to repair the situation and to restore the tree of life to humanity, to the access of those whom God has qualified in humanity to come eat again of the tree of life and live with him forever. But out in that outer world into which Adam and Eve are now cast, they will now be confronted by satanic influences constantly. And all humans will inherit this plight and will, because they will be born into this fallen world, and will thereby inherit the original act of sin that caused the world to fall and will live in, uh, in the, the atmosphere of Satan's temptations, uh, his challenges to God and his holiness, and will be, we will all be uh, challenged to be immersed in evil all the days of our lives from then till now and in all time to come. It will be a constant danger to Adam and Eve and to their posterity of which we are part. They have lost, that is to say, we have lost, thereby uh, uh, more than words can adequately describe. I urge you sometimes to sit down with uh, your Bible in a quiet place, turn off your TV, leave your phone in another room as I have a habit of doing and have it muted read these chapters and think about the great blessing that the Garden of Eden was to mankind and that a free access to the presence of God and what we lost and is now a barrier of sin between us and him. And just to think about it, roll it over in your mind and in your meditation and sort of see if you can uh, just imagine what would have been and thereby how much we lost in the action of our first uh, parents. 
And one other thing before we go on. I urge us, one and all, I, yea, I beseech all of us, do not, not take lightly the banishment of Adam and Eve from the access to the tree of life. It is a significant thing. We don't uh, perhaps talk about it like we should, but they have been separated from the very source, the physical source, if we will, that God placed before them that would give them life, eternal life. There's nothing to account for uh, this uh, fiasco uh, that uh, would cause us to see anything humorous about it. The Garden of Eden is not a humorous thing at the end, nothing to laugh about, as many times may, many make light of it, no, it's the saddest moment in the earliest history of the human race. The loss is colossal. The impact incalculable. Our first parents forfeited blessings and relationships and unaccountable benefits by eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And there's nothing funny about it, and we need to stop joking about it. We need to notice that we must never forget, also in this regard, that the instigator of sin is still very much with us. Satan still abounds. It is sort of, sort of uh, almost inexplicable why after these chapters in early Genesis, we do not encounter the name of Satan for quite some time in the Bible. But his actions are very, very much to be observed in everything that happens from now on until this day in which we live. The out in the worldly world, that is Satan's dominion, Paul refers to him as the prince of the power of the air. Out there where Adam and Eve are now being banished in this text, into which we are all born. Satan is not mentioned much in the Bible for a while, but he is still here. He's still there in those earlier parts of the Bible that, that uh, come forth out of the fourth chapter of Genesis. And the worldly world is still his dominion then and now. He is Satan, that old devil, the arch enemy of God, and the accuser of humanity. So it's, it is wise, it's, it's necessary to bear in mind this great fact as we study the remainder of the highlights or the great events of the Old Testament and as we read the rest of the Bible in all of its entirety in both the Old Testament and in that glorious and wonderful great news of the New Testament. Satan, the old devil, is still the instigator of human sin. He hates us because he hates our Father in heaven who created us in his image. And there is a war going on in the hearts of us all, moment by moment. Now we know that the book of Revelation presents the victory over Satan being uh, already accomplished in Jesus. I don't know how to explain how since the resurrection and the ascension of our Lord that uh, we still are in a world where Satan is loosed. But there, this is dealt with in the book of Revelation, and the interpretations are many. But Satan will continue to be the adversary, the enemy of God, and of God's people, until the consummation of God's processes, when eternity begins and there's nothing left in time as to a part of time. And he, Satan, devil, the old devil, will continue to be the tempter and the spoiler of human peace and the peace of mind 
until the destruction of Satan as described in Revelation 20 and verse 10 finally consummates the processes of God in time and we enter into eternity without time. And then, as we are taught in the book of Revelation, the tree of life will be restored to all of those who are a part of, body, of the body of Jesus Christ, the spiritual body. So specifically, the decree of God should haunt us. This man, God says, has now become like one of us. And so, yes, the Satan, that old devil, knew what he, whereof he spoke when he told Eve, when you eat of that tree, you won't die. You'll become like God. You'll know things that only God knows. And implying to Adam and Eve, or to Eve and then to Adam, that God's withholding something that would be good for you if you would just go ahead and eat that fruit. The one who said, let us make man in our image, in Genesis 1, 26, the us of Father, Son, and Spirit in creating power, God, the Holy Spirit, Genesis 1, 2, and the Word, the Logos, Jesus, in John 1, 1, and 3, that entity of what we sometimes refer to as the Trinity, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the concept of the triunity of the Godhead is, until that holy council of godliness, of God, godness and holiness, has decreed that the time has come to end time, we will live in the human predicament of doing battle with sin and with Satan, the originator thereof. So specifically, let's uh, sort of summarize. <clears throat> God said uh, they will know the difference between good and evil. So uh, this was originally the domain of God. And for his reasons, and his uh, reasons alone, God did create man with the capacity to know the difference. He just didn't uh, activate that equipment until Adam sinned and became the possessor of knowledge that only God intended to have, at least for his purposes. Because of this man in his pristine uh, existence as the uh, uh, manager of the Garden of Eden with his mate, passed from the scene into the worldly world outside the garden, and they began then to have children, and that uh, first family became the beginning of the human family that down to our time is uh, impacted in a disastrous way by the act of sin uh, in the Garden of Eden. And so, uh, being now corrupted in the flesh, uh, God is making clear we, we can't let him stay here in the Garden of Eden, lest he put forth his hand and eat of the fruit of the tree of life and live forever. Now, when we think about that, it is a tremendous blessing that God did not allow that to happen. He would reach forth his hand and take that fruit of, of life, and in that sinful state of a human body, live forever. If you've reached a certain age when you, your bones creak when you get out of bed, you lay something down, and then when you need it again, it takes you an hour to find it. When you get old, I'm saying, and your body begins to uh, have to have more time just to move itself around, you will count the blessing that God gave to us to keep our first parents from eating of the tree of life in a sinful condition so that we will not have to live eternally in bodies that are dying and doomed, but that we can be transformed by the gift of God in his Son, Jesus Christ, and have the Spirit of the living God re renewed within us, as Paul tells Titus in Titus uh, chapter 3. 
and in the power of God and the resurrection of Jesus, we can enter into the eternal purpose of God, heaven, and shed these shells of the human body for all eternity. And so I am so thankful, aren't you, that God would not allow Adam and his wife to eat that tree of life in a sinful condition. And so the implications of this fact are endless. And we can maybe answer, uh, just mention a few. We can only imagine what the world situation would be now, as sinfully rotten, bad as it is, with the constant touch of Satan upon the activities of humans. Adam and Eve would have been allowed to eat of the tree in that sinful state, and obviously the eternal purpose of God, of which I have just spoken, would have been frustrated in a way that would not have been rectified as it uh, has been rectified in the sacrifice of Jesus. The destiny of the human race would have been eternally tarnished, ruined, and we would be in an impossible situation, forever estranged from God, in sin, separated into a broken world as enemies of the Almighty in a body that is dying. We would be the custodians of the total wreckage of the enterprise of God, and the plight of humanity would be absolutely unthinkable. Thank God he closed the door, the gate to the garden, and he took action that would preclude the tree of life being eaten by humanity uh, in their sin. But there's still there's more. Uh, he sent him forth to work the ground and to take care of that which God had made him. And now man is to earn his own food. And when we get to the covenant with Noah after the flood, we will see God adding to the diet of humanity meat of animals right now he's just to eat from the from the produce of the ground and so Adam was uh, and he were vegetarians again the destiny of man includes the destiny of his wife and all of humanity and if you want to know the circumstances that is the foundation of the oft repeated modern statement there is no free lunch this is it right here Adam is banished from the free access of all the satisfaction of all of his needs. He has to go to work. Which I might add here as an aside to, to a lot of people who are trying to avoid work and get a handout, it's a good idea to go to work. You'll be, you'll be surprised how much good it will do you. If you're able, go get a job and find out. God then made the tree of life secure. Uh, there would be no possibility that man and his wife could eat of that tree in that sinful condition because what God, what God did. And there was no human being would be able to until God moved things to, his, to consummate his eternal purpose that is described in Ephesians chapter 7 through 11. The guard which the Almighty set in place in, uh, is an awesome presence. The guard of Cherubim, which would be the correct Hebrew pronunciation, is at the east of the Garden of Eden. The east has significant uh, meanings in the processes of God, all of which uh, I don't know. But we do have a clear definition uh, that uh, this is a significant place and the Cherubim are a significant force to keep it inaccessible. And so this kind of angels is not uh, stated specifically, but there are, it is a different kind from some of the other angels we have encountered in the Bible. Uh, it is a plural number, cherubim, and we do not have an indication of, as to how many. We know in the fourth and fifth chapters of Revelation that the angels number beyond numbering, myriads and myriads, and apparently there are different categories of different kinds, but uh, there is uh, an army of cherubim that would keep the Garden of Eden from access by humanity until God's good time 
but by the power of the blood and the resurrection of Jesus, we can join him in eternity in the full access to the garden, to the tree of life. The passages for that, which I I intended to read, but I I need to not take that time now, but the passages you want to read to read about the restoration of the tree of life are these, all of them in, in the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation, verses 1 and 2, and verses uh, 12 through 14. So be, be assured, God's eternal purpose is secure. The tree of life is totally protected. It will be opened to the access of the redeemed of humanity when the timetable of God has reached its point where it's time when time will be no more. Thank you for being with me today. I'm so glad to be back with you, to talking with you by this medium, and uh, just to discuss and to share the glories of the Word of God. God bless you.